patients will be able to come back at any point and, and you know, reclaim the child and that they'll lose custody of the child. Um, and, and that's not true. <laughs> once, you know, when things have gone through all the proper legal channels and the birth parents' rights have been legally terminated, they no longer have any legal rights to that baby and they cannot come back and overturn the adoption. Wow, I did not know that. Because um, that is the fear that I've heard people talk about is fear that the uh, um, birth parent would find out later on. Um, what is your stance when it comes to when the uh, child gets older of going and looking for the birth parents? Because I have heard of the cases of that, too, where sometimes, you know, as the child gets older, they realize that the parents that they that raised them were not their natural parents. And for whatever reasons, it might be health reasons because of genetic health issues or it might be just because of their natural curiosity that they decided they want to go find the um, birth parent. Is that something that with your support group you encourage or you actually encourage people not to go into these kind of pursuits? Well, so a couple of thoughts on that. These days, you know, kind of the what the research shows that's healthiest for the child is that they always know that they have been adopted. It's not something that they find out later in life, right? It's just always part of their story um, where the adoptive parents, you know, talk to them about it from, from the time when they're a baby, you know, so they just grow up knowing that this is their story. And, um, you know, adoption over the years has trended to more and more openness and their adoptions for the most part aren't as open as a lot of people hear stories about or a lot of pre-adoptive parents fear that they are. It's not like co-parenting with the birth parents, but usually there is some level of contact, whether it's sending, um, you know, updates through the adoption agency or, you know, whether it is um, the adoptive parents and the birth parents, um, you know, maybe they have anonymous email addresses that they can share updates with each other directly. And sometimes it's more than that. Sometimes it's phone calls once a year or some texts or that kind of thing. But usually there's some level of communication that way. Um, health information can be shared, those types of things. So these days, you know, if the adopted child at some point chooses that they want to have that connection, directly, um, it, it's not really as big a deal. They don't often have to go sort of on this big search. Um, usually their adoptive parents will say, well, you know, I have the contact information of, of the birth parents. And, and although it's, um, it's something that when people begin to think about adoption, when they start the process, they, they never believe me <laughs> when I tell them this. But when that, by the time that time comes, usually it's the adoptive parents that are looking for more openness than the birth parents are. Um, so they're usually very comfortable with sharing that information and encouraging the child to get their questions answered. Um, and, and again, all the research shows that that is, you know, in, in the best interest of the child in terms of their mental health. That way they don't have a lot of these unanswered questions. They don't grow up thinking, um, you know, with fantasies about who their birth parents were or thinking that, somehow they they did something wrong and that's why they were placed for adoption right and these are a lot of the unhealthy thoughts that some adoptees would suffer with you know back when adoptions were very closed so really the whole system has changed so much over the last few decades um, that you don't sort of end up in that position where an adult finds out that they were adopted and they didn't know before and then they have to go on this big search for their birth parents well, that's good to know that folks are actually finding out at an early age and things of that nature. Now, the other thing that I've heard about, and I've had some friends that have gone through the in vitro process, which you are also dealing with with some of your uh, support group and things of that nature work, is that I know that some people actually, they want the um, in vitro partner involved. And I don't know what your feelings are on that part of it as well. I know some folks that actually had the in vitro person involved in the raising of the child and in the whole process and some people just want you know to be like the anonymous donors that we always hear about when they when we usually hear about donors and things of that mm -hmm. nature and nobody has any clue who that person is but i have heard of some friends and some acquaintances that you know for whatever reasons they couldn't have children of their own and you know they might have reached out to somebody in their circle whether that was a friend whether that was a whoever but they tried to like have somebody that they felt comfortable with so i don't know whether you've had cases of that or what your thoughts are on that because I have had some friends of mine that have gone through that and actually 
wanted to know who the in vitro partner was in terms of being involved with the raising of the child, or at least knowing about their being involved in the creation of the child, even though the child was raised by the parent. Right. Yeah, so you're talking about when they're using a donor egg or donor sperm in the in vitro Correct. process. Right. Yeah, and, you know, that – Gosh, that that depends on so many different factors. A lot of times, you know, people will use anonymous donor egg or donor sperm. Other times people will ask, you know, family members to help or, like you said, you know, a friend or something like that. So it depends just so much on the situation. But, you know, what what I strongly encourage and what every um, ethical infertility doctor's office is, in, in many cases is going to require, if, if certainly not strongly encourage, is that everyone in the process um, go through counseling um, and go through um, mental health examinations. In fact, if you're going to be an anonymous donor, they require that you go through mental health screening before you're accepted to be a donor. Um, But if it is, you know, family members or friends or people you know, then they'll usually require that you go through counseling together um, and that up front you kind of work out what the parameters are going to be, that everybody's kind of thought about and worked through what are the kinds of feelings that might come up, what are the kinds of circumstances that might come up and sort of throw us for a loop you know, that we weren't expecting and that everybody comes to some sort of understanding about those. Not that relationships and emotions don't change over the years, but that at least everybody's kind of on the same page going into the process. Um, And that counseling and therapy is just absolutely critical. I, I, you know, could never imagine anyone going into that type of scenario without having had that. And again, I, I believe almost every well, every ethical fertility doctor's office is actually going to require that as part of the process these days. Yeah, because part of what happens, at least from what I've seen from some of my friends, is that sometimes uh, it's, like you said, um, the traditional family that wants to adopt. But then there's also a very growing LGBT community that's out there. So sometimes those people that are in very loving relationships want to have a child. And since, you know, it takes the two genders to make the child, then they will sometimes go that route. And I also know that in some cases, having had some friends that were involved in, for lack of a better term, the swinging kind of aspect of the world and everything, they want children as well. And sometimes that's where the in vitro partners come into play. Mm-hmm. But I do know that I've got some friends that are definitely out of the LGBT community and they're sitting there going like, you know, they want a child because I've got at least three friends and maybe more than that that are part of those kind of relationships and they've um, had children from the donor situation so they could have a child to raise while they were in these loving relationships that they were part of. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, and with adoption as well, you know, certainly over the years I've worked with lots of, of gay and lesbian couples and years ago it used to be very difficult for them to get selected by the potential birth parents Um, It was very, very hard um, for LGBTQ families to get selected to adopt. But these days, it's so much more common, um, and it's no harder for them to get selected than a traditional couple. And in some instances, it's actually easier. Um, So that's, you know, that's really exciting as well that adoption is, um, I think, much more of an option for those families these days as well than it used to be. And uh, in terms of your own organization, what is the target geographic area that you're serving particularly? Are you serving primarily uh, the East Coast, uh, the North Carolina, South Carolina area? But what is your primary area that you're serving? Are you serving the whole country or the whole world? Yeah, and I I serve – well, I I basically serve U.S. citizens anywhere that they are. So, um, so it has to at least one. If it's a if it's a married couple, at least one of them has to be a U.S. citizen. If it's a single person, they have to be a U.S. citizen. Um, I work mostly throughout the U.S., but I also do work with some families where U.S. citizens are living abroad. Oh, cool! So you're working with people from throughout the world that are working on this very important issue that is definitely one that is needs to be heard more about and things of that nature. So I know a lot of times. Um, now, at what point do you think that folks should, uh, if you were to give people advice as to when they should consider adoption or going for these kind of like methods, um, what, what, what is your own personal advice? Because I know sometimes people want to hear from their minister because of, some people are very much mm-hmm. into their ministerial counselors or they want to hear from their uh, academic kind of folks because some people are more academic oriented so, or they want to hear from their parents as to, you know, like you've tried it now for 
two years, you've tried it for three years, you haven't had a child, maybe it's time to look into other means of having children. At what point, as a counselor, do you suggest that people start thinking about these other methods, whether it's adoption, whether it's um, the various other methods that are out there in vitro, right. or whether it's uh, fostering. We didn't talk about fostering, but fostering is another element that sometimes people will yep. go to when they're trying to find a child of their own. Well, from, from a medical perspective, what the re- recommendation is, which I agree with, is that if you are under 35, if you've been actively trying to get pregnant for a year without success, that that's time where you should seek out um, alternate paths. Um, and, and if the woman is over 35, then after six months of trying, um, you know, it, it can't hurt to kind of go speak to uh, an infertility doctor as soon as possible. But as like you were asking in terms of adoption as well, and this is very hard for people who are really focused on achieving a pregnancy and having a biological child, um, but it can never hurt to think about, okay, if that doesn't work, what are my next steps going to be and planning for them as early as possible because all of these steps are very expensive. Um, And, you know, I end up talking to a lot of people who want to adopt, but they've spent so much money trying to, you know, go through fertility treatments and then it leaves them in a really tough position. And a lot of times they say to me, you know, I I wish I'd thought about that earlier. And then maybe instead of that last treatment, maybe I would have thought about adoption a little bit earlier and I wouldn't be in this financial situation. Um, So I think thinking through all of your options early on and saying, okay, you know, if this works, great, this is the plan. But if this doesn't work, what's the plan going to be then and how can I best be prepared for that um, can really serve you well in the long run. Because that actually raises a very important issue that you bring up, which is the cost of adoption, uh, the various fertilization methods that are out there. They're not cheap in the least bit, and we oftentimes hear about the negative aspect of that, meaning that, one, people that want to have children that live in kind of poor neighborhoods, whether that's public housing, which we were talking about earlier here in Durham, or whether that's mm-hmm. um, kind of like things that are parts of our community that cannot afford these kind of methods, would like to have children, but they don't feel that there's opportunities for them because of the cost limitations. And then the flip side of that is some people that are kind of, uh, I don't want to put it in overly negative senses, but they feel like they're forced to put the child up for adoption or put it up for fostering because they feel that they, they can't afford to take care of the child, whether that's them being involved in drugs, whether that's financial reasons, whether that's for whatever reasons, maybe they were involved in an abusive relationship and the baby came out of that. But you see, these things are kind of the flip side of the positive side of fostering and adoption. Yeah, they they certainly are. And of course, there's always um, conversation and, and always controversy about those things. You know, fortunately, there there are a lot of community resources for, for both sides of the equation. You know, there are grants and support available for people who, um, you know, are trying to adopt and need financial support to do that. And of course, there are, you know, community resources for people who want to parent, you know, and, and may struggle financially or with, you know, like you were saying, addiction or other problems that might make that difficult for them. Um, There probably aren't uh, as many community resources as would be great, or they're not as well funded as as it would be nice for them to be. Um, But there are resources out there, again, for both sides of that equation, so that everybody who needs help in one way or the other, you know, there are ways to get it. Good. Well, I'm glad that those kind of things are out there. If you would, would you share people with people? And I do want to get to, I think we have another guest who might be shifting the conversation more to entertainment, but I do want you to stay on the line and everything because we might even have conversation that goes across the conversation because that's what we like to do here on the show and everything. But if you could real quickly share with uh, folks your website and how folks can get in touch with you to learn more about these uh, very important issues like uh, fostering in vitro adoption and some of the other things that you're involved with. Sure, absolutely. My website is theadoptionconsultancy.com, and I'm also on Facebook under The Adoption Consultancy. So those are the best ways to find me. All right. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, Dean, I think I heard a bell earlier. You did. We have uh, John Shane standing by. All right. Well, we'll bring John Shane on. I'm expecting to talk to him about the wonderful world of blues. But uh, definitely stay on the line 
as well uh, because, like I said, there may be some cross conversations because I know John is always involved and interested in a variety of things in just in the world in addition to being.